I love Kim's movement. I'm just doing theme music in my head. <laughs> Hello everyone, good morning. I'm Stephanie Lemick. I am so excited to have another awesome panel pulled together for us today. And today we are going to be talking about a super important principle of trauma-informed workplaces empowerment. So before we dive into our discussion, I would love to have each of our guests go ahead and introduce themselves. So I will start with you, Rebecca. Hi, I'm Rebecca Baumgartner. I am an HR and diversity, equity, and inclusion leader um, based in Kansas City, Missouri. And I am so excited to come and talk about this topic because I think it's so impactful and important in today's workplace. Awesome. We're glad to have you. Alex. Hi, Alex Seiler. I feel like I shouldn't be here with these fabulous women that I was allowed <laughs> to join. Um, so I'm a chief people officer and a startup advisor. And um, this topic speaks to my heart because I've been through some challenges in the workplace in my career. Mm -hmm. And I know others have, and I see it firsthand um, now that I've been through it. So really happy to be here and talk on this topic. Absolutely. So glad to have you here, Alex. And just in case anyone wants to know who's doing the best job fighting the HR isn't fun stereotype, it's Alex. <laughs> Kim. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Kim Rower. I've been in the people HR leadership space for about the last 15 years. And now I am a free agent. I'm consulting and advising um, everything from values, strategy, to career coaching, to personal empowerment, which is the thing that drove me to, to this topic. Um, very excited to talk about how you as an individual can kind of claim your place in empowerment uh, in your own workplace. Awesome. Kim is also an amazing writer. If you follow her on LinkedIn, you know Thank she you. has amazing posts, and I'm pretty sure she recently started a Substack, so I did. maybe worth checking out as well. <laughs> yes, I felt a little strange the first time I posted. I was like, "So I'm a Substack person now. I have one." We love it. We love but it. It's awesome. It's fun to do. And of course, last but not least, Erica. Hi, I'm Erica. I am a Chief People Officer for a tech company in the Raleigh, North Carolina area. I'm also a keynote speaker executive coach and consultant, podcast host, wife, mom, and fitness crazed fanatic. So all the things all in one. <laughs> I'm super pumped to be here. Amazing. We love Erica. I know I've had conversations with my friend and we're like, we don't know how Erica does it all, but we love it. And it's all awesome. I don't know how I do it all, but you know what? I'm here. Somehow. Yeah, Erica, just hearing that, I was like exhausted for you, let alone yes. doing it. <laughs> yes. But I do prioritize eight hours of sleep a night. You better believe that. Good for you. Yeah, That's amazing. amazing. Oh, we all just got really jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I was I'm like, jealous we're tired. tired. I don't know. <laughs> are, are your kids beyond the waking up in the middle of the night stage? <laughs> oh, no, they're five and eight. And quite literally, as I was doing my introduction, my husband texts me that my five-year-old has a 101 point something. Oh, feet. no. Like, you know, that's what it is. Yep. That's just that was us last week. That's just life. Yep. It is. It is. Well, thank you all. As as you can see, we have an amazing, like I said, an amazing lineup today. I'm so excited. Um, before we jump into the questions, I always like to provide a little context about what we're talking about today. So we are talking about empowerment as a principle of trauma-informed workplaces. And at the core of trauma and traumatic experiences is a feeling of powerlessness, a lack of control, and choice over what is happening to you or around you. This feeling of helplessness can lead to lasting impacts on an individual's sense of self and power over their own lives. Because a feeling of lack of control or helplessness can be so tied to trauma, empowerment is one of the most important principles in creating a trauma-informed workplace. Empowerment in the context of trauma-informed workplaces is about more than just choice. It is also about environments where in individuals feel valued and that they are making a meaningful contribution. For that reason, when we look at the concept of empowerment in a trauma-informed culture, we look at four distinct parts, choice, strengths leveraged, recognition, and growth. 
With that said, we will go ahead and dive into our questions for our panelists. And I'd love to start with a personal story from each of you. And I would love for you to share one of your most empowering moments in your career, whether it's big or small, when did you feel the most empowered and why? So I'll kick it off. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Silence is making me feel awkward, but here we go. I'll fill that. <laughs> um, for me, the most empowering moment that I can think of is when I worked for a company, I had this great idea that would really revamp the way we did work. And I pitched this idea to my people leader at the time. And unbeknownst to me, he pitched that idea as his own. And in that idea, I had a new role that I would essentially fill. That's why I pitched this whole idea. But because of the way politics played out and everything, that role was then given to someone else. And when I tell you I was devastated, I was just crying in my car every single day because I felt like every bit of empowerment had been stripped for me. I felt like I had no choice. I felt like no strengths were forever going to be leveraged. There was absolutely no recognition. And with that change, there was no more growth for me at that company. So I, all those four parts that you talked about, Stephanie, were completely gone for me. And I spent probably a good two weeks in my car crying every single day at lunch, just mm -hmm. trying to figure out how I could make it through and like, what could I actually do about this? And when I was able to pull myself up out of that helplessness, I realized that I did have my own choice and I had agency over my own choices. And so for me, the empowerment was recognizing that I did not have to stay at a place that was not going to provide me mm -hmm. the trust, the safety, the recognition that I felt I deserved. And I actually reached out into my network and that is how I climbed all the way to the C-suite. And once I got that right and I got into my new role, I realized how powerful that felt for me and how empowering I realized that I could be for my own self and that I had agency over my choices. So that would be my, my big story. Yeah, that is, that's, I'm, I'm sure like we all have, you know, examples of how we've been made to feel less than at work. Right. And I, and I love how you're like, I realized myself and I was able to empower myself and it wasn't coming from an external source. It was coming from me. And, and that's, you know, that's fantastic. Um, I would say for me, one of the most empowering things for me was having an amazing leader who did have kind of that trust in me. And I was, you know, I was new to the role and I was still kind of learning the ropes and I needed that guidance and that those resources and kind of understanding. But um, instead of saying, well, here you need to do A, B and C, they're like, here's everything that you may need. If you need anything else, let me know. Here's the outcome that we need here you go, have at it, you know, we go, go, go forth and conquer. And I think for me, just that kind of, that kind of leadership and, and guidance was extremely empowering because I felt like I, I had agency. I was able to contribute in a meaningful way to me, to, to the organization. So mm -hmm. that is something that has always stood uh, and stayed with me for, for a long time. Yeah. I, it's, it's so funny hearing these stories. I feel like I mean, I can't speak for Alex yet, but I feel like there's a common thread happening here where I, my, the time that I felt most empowered was when I sort of stumbled upon the idea of competency-based career growth and, um, you know, actually creating job descriptions to match titles with competencies that are different from level to level. Um, early on in my career, I had been growing, growing my HR career. And I realized at one point that I was the only executive on the executive team that didn't have a VP title. I was still a, a director and everyone else was a VP. I was like, there is no other fucking VP of people. It's just me. Like, why can't I get that title? Um, and with sitting down with my CEO who had just as much experience as I did at the same age at this baby startup. It's like, what do I need to do to get that VP title? How can I can you just give it to me? Is it because I haven't asked for it? Like, do I need to prove something to get there? What is it that is preventing you from giving me that same title so that I can be recognized on equal footing with my peers? Um, and we had a good heart to heart about it. And he said, okay, let me think about it and I'll put together the list of the job description so we can compare where you're at today to where that is. And it turns out once we did that work, there wasn't really much room 
between them, it's like, oh, okay, if you start doing this one thing, then I really feel good about making this change official. Um, and I, that was the first experience I had had with really self-advocacy and um, leaning on my strengths and really taking charge and thinking like, you know, I'm seeing something here that doesn't seem right. And I don't know why it's not right, but I don't think it's because you don't like me. So like, how can we make, how can we get to the happy place? Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, that, that moment really changed the way I think about career development and, and informed my now coaching practice. I mean, that was like 10 years ago. And I'm still using those lessons in how I deal with competency frameworks and career career growth and uh, mentorship and advocacy. There's a lot of buzzwords all at the end of that sentence there. Tell so Alex. I'll add to Kim's point in a different way. Um, <laughs> So this might sound strange, but my most empowering moment was leaving a job. Um, so <laughs> as everyone knows, um, so I'm not going to say which one, but if you want to look through my LinkedIn, you can take a step <laughs> um, <laughs> to figure out which company it was. Um, so I was at a company where I noticed something that wasn't right and it became an integrity issue for me. And I felt very empowered in myself that I spoke out about it. I'm going to be very honest though, the people that were around me, I expected more of, and they didn't support mm -hmm. me in the way that they should have. And I think that created a level of a trauma informed response in that, you know what? don't always think that the people that should be there for you are going to be there for mm -hmm. you as much as they should. Um, and the moment that like enlightened me that it was like time to leave was when I got a piece of feedback and it was, Alex, you'd like to hold people accountable, but this is not a culture where people like to be held accountable. And I was yeah, like, oh, this is, this is for me then. Um, but yeah. Um, you know, the moment that I heard that, I was like, I got to get out of here. But also, like, how do you actually measure effectiveness at that point? So, but, you know, when I heard that, I'm not going to lie. I was like, this is the most useless feedback I've ever received. But in hindsight, as time has gone by, I was like, this is the most useful feedback. Because I realize every time I, I look for a job, I'm like, if you don't have any level of accountability, I got nothing for you. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be part of you. I'm not going to be here for you your people need to go elsewhere. So it was actually like super helpful yeah. in the grand scheme of things. Like sounds like that helped you like acknowledge yeah. and define your value system. Totally. Your, like mm -hmm. your must haves. Yeah. Isn't that, so just like two things here, like number one, accidentally a bunch of HR professionals are on here talking about one of the most <laughs> empowered things they ever experienced was like, I left this job. <laughs> that doesn't say anything about the the, if the field right now um i don't know what does and then i've had a similar experience alex where it's just like you're getting feedback you're getting this like what is this organization doing it's like not matching my values and i remember i got a it's different feedback but a similar experience i i got feedback you're always willing to do the hard thing so you end up doing all the hard things and i was mm. like so why doesn't anyone else do the hard things. They're like, well, they'll know you, they know you'll do them for them. And I'm like, that is the worst. Yeah. <laughs> like it's a little bit of the accountability piece. So yeah. I love it. I love it. Also, I would also add to that, Stephanie, like, are they being asked the same things that you are? So mm -hmm. or is it just convenient that you're being asked the tough stuff too? Mm -hmm. Right. You know? Well, and I think part of that, and, and it's something that I've I've struggled with, you know, with my own teams and, and my own experience that, you know, sometimes we think that giving recognition means giving and, and strengths leadership is giving people things that they're good at, that they are able to do. But at the same time, we're not really looking at that engagement piece. Is it actually yeah. like a hidden detractor and a disengagement factor that we're giving them this thing that they're good at, but that they don't enjoy and that we're not mm -hmm. expecting the same thing from other people. So I think that's yeah. a great example of what of what that looks like in action. Yeah. Stuff. And Rebecca, to your point, like, and how much are we putting on one person just because mm -hmm. they're great versus like right. spreading the love to figure out if other people can do it. Right? Yeah, and growing other people's skills yeah. and developing them instead of just relying on the one person who's, no offense, Stephanie, sucker enough to. <laughs> to <do it. laughs> 
<laughs> well, and who's asking those people why they're not taking on the harder work? Yeah. And yeah. if the, like the useful feedback would be, you know, Stephanie, people don't feel like they can take on the hard work because you jump in too quickly. Yeah. Let's see how we can get more people to take some stuff on. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, but right. that's, yes. I mean, I'm an amazing manager, obviously. So I would only ever give feedback like that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, that's, I think when you're looking at, when you're looking at workplaces and trauma and the type of work that people take on, you know, like I'm not a psychologist. I just have been in HR a long time. <laughs> like, the, sometimes the reason that someone is taking on the hard stuff over and over is because of something that they're feeding within themselves. And that's not necessarily a healthy thing that they're doing. Mm -hmm. So like you can actually help people break out of, of these cycles that they're in these like negative reinforcing cycles um, by actually listening to what they like and what they're, mm -hmm. why they're doing things instead of just saying you do this too much. Yeah. I would love to point out, though, that, you know, Stephanie, you said it's amazing that we have all these HR professionals on here saying that an empowering moment for them was when they left a job. But I think yeah. in the beginning part, like that's something you've never had to do or you never thought mm -hmm. that you would do. And you never thought that you would be in this experience where trust is broken or values mm -hmm. aren't aligning. Mm -hmm. And you stew on that for a little bit and it sits with you and you're really uncomfortable for enough of a time period, right? Everybody's got different thresholds, but you were not okay with it. So that when you finally rise to meet that occasion, you're like, damn, I'm good. Like, mm -hmm. I didn't know I had that in me, but I yeah. pulled it out and now yeah. look at me. So it's almost like this, for lack of better words, fairy tale, where you have this like big traumatic thing that you're facing, whether it's trust or misaligned values. And then when you overcome that, you're like, holy shit, I'm awesome. Mm -hmm. Like this is mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. let's talk about storytelling and the hero's journey and the heroine's journey. Yeah. I feel there like you go. We're all living out our own narrative. Exactly. But Erica, you bring up a really good point in that, and I don't know if anyone else on here has experienced this, but I came through being a foreign national and getting a green card. And before I got that, like everything was also, I felt powerless in a lot of ways because it was about, mm -hmm. it was about impressing my employers so that I would get promoted. And so they would get me that green card. So I felt, it felt like indentured servitude. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because it was like, until I felt free, quote unquote, like they could do whatever they wanted because they knew they had me on the line. Yeah. So I think we forget about these foreign workers who are in this position where they've got like zero sort of skin in the game, even if they wanted to feel powerful, like they're like, they're concerned about their actual, you know, work authorization and welfare. So we've got to remember that there's a difference. We're not all living the same line, so to speak on this mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. You're very right, Alex. And I deal with a lot of immigration status individuals where I currently work. And that is one of the things that yes, the Department of Labor has salary standards that you must stick to, but what they don't recognize or account for is that flexibility to move within other jobs if they are not happy in their role, yeah. if they don't like their leader. Mm -hmm. And those are all things that are very unfair. Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. we've got to figure out a better way to do that because literally when you work with immigration attorneys, they're like, you'll have to give them a plane ticket home. And I'm like, well, that's mm -hmm. not an answer, right? Like now I, <laughs> that's not an answer for me. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I th you guys are hitting on such uh, important piece. And, and we talked about this quite a bit, actually, in our um, collaboration panel, because we talk a lot about positional power and privilege as mm -hmm. it relates to collab yeah. collaboration. And it's such a great point mm -hmm. when you think about empowerment, positional power and privilege, yeah. uh, all these things are intertwined and interact in that a lack of power or a lack of privilege can work against feeling mm -hmm. empowered. Um, and, you know, how can we think about overcoming that as we look to drive empowerment in our organizations? It's just, I mean, that's such yeah. an important question for us to tackle. Mm -hmm. to really I do tackle. a lot of coaching with uh, folks who are more junior in their careers, maybe mm -hmm. at that mid-level, where they really what they're looking for is scripting. They're looking for like, how can I speak up for myself without mm -hmm. pissing off my mm -hmm. boss? Yeah. How can I how can I get to this goal even though I have no power in this situation or mm -hmm. I perceive that I have no power in the situation? Um, and I, it breaks my heart so much because there's a lot of times where people, uh, they have more agency than they think, even if mm -hmm. they don't have power. And if they're, if you're phrasing the questions in the right way or you're asking the right questions, 
you can get to those results without jeopardizing your career. And I think that's for people who are who are not in a position of privilege to be like, well, if I get fired, I get fired, but I have to stand up for myself, which most people are not. Um, learning how to have those empowered conversations when you're not in a position of power, I think is is really critical, especially for, for again, folks who are younger, more junior in their careers, or folks who are here on, uh, on visas, or just folks, again, like who can't afford to lose their job. Yeah. And I would say to Kim's point, like what I've learned in my career is people that speak out very quickly are usually speaking out too fast and misinformed and just seeking to have an audience. But the people on my team who've like spoke to me afterwards and asked me questions are the ones that should have asked the question in the moment because they are super informed. They're just too scared to ask the question in a bigger audience. And they're the people that we actually want to hear from because they've taken the time to digest the content and be really thoughtful mm -hmm. about it as well. Yeah. And I would also say, and just from like a DEI perspective, I think empowerment and belonging are so intertwined because it's hard to feel like you have power, right? You know, kind of to Kim's point, it's hard to feel power when you don't feel like you belong in the first place. Yeah. when you don't feel like you're you're trusted or you're valued um you know for marginalized underrepresented communities it's not as dire as international and foreign workers but there is still a lot of of trauma involved in there there's still a lot of you know being scared like oh i'm the only you know black person in on my team if i speak up i'm immediately kind of I already have one strike against me being the only. And now if I speak mm -hmm. up, I'm going to be seen as a troublemaker and I'm going to feed into this stereotype. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that really taking a look at empowerment through a lens of belonging is really, really important. Absolutely. Oof. I knew this would be a good conversation. <laughs> We're going deep, y'all. Yeah, I love it. So, I mean, we've covered this quite a bit already, but if you had to sum it up, you know, quickly, for a leader or a manager, why would you say empowerment is so important in the workplace, in today's workplace? I think you need a, you need a variety of perspectives to have yeah. a successful workplace. And if you're, if you're a leader and the people who report into you don't feel empowered to ask questions, to challenge, to grow themselves, you're missing out on a whole lot of knowledge and probably creativity and differing perspectives, right? And as a leader, I think it's really important to demonstrate what inclusive empowerment looks like and to demonstrate what it looks like to empower someone actively who mm -hmm. is not going to just raise their hand and jump up. I think mean, it's it's such a beautiful thing when you have those leaders who say, like, who do, who do it publicly, who yeah. mm -hmm. call on you without calling you out, who ask for your opinion actively, who give you the space to formulate an opinion instead of like putting you on the spot, like whatever the, whatever that looks like on your team, as a leader, it's so powerful to, to, to have that kind of proactive, inclusive approach to mm -hmm. empowering folks, especially when you're dealing with people who are not, um, let me say this delicately, <laughs> who are not like spoiled, privileged kids who are going to speak up for themselves no matter what, mm -hmm. you know, that's, well, that's like a you'll really... always have those people in the workplace. Who... Yeah. Well, and I think that kind of brings up a good point, too, when you talk about like generations in the workplace. I think, you know, empowerment is good just because of that. Right. Because you need to start thinking more that, you know, younger generations, Gen Z, millennials, they, that's what they want. That's what they're looking for now in, in a workplace. And if we can't give that to them. If we are not able to meet their need there, we're, you know, we're going to have a really hard time hiring, keeping and engaging a productive workforce. And I think kind of going along with that, you know, we have so many different generations and you've got like the boomers and, you know, you kind of got that Jack Welch management style that's kind of built in that is very, you know, Six Sigma efficiency, economic profits driven and stacked ranking and all of this, this, this crazy things that just don't fly today because it doesn't provide that kind of empowerment. And we're seeing a lot of conflict in the workplace because of that. And it's, I think that's a big struggle too, that from a management and an executive leadership perspective, we need to continuously and try and reinform everybody what, what like leadership looks like from that, mm -hmm. from that perspective. Yeah. I would also add to that is, 
as we all know, micromanagement is the the last thing from empowerment, right? And so one thing I've always done is try to push decision making down to my team so that I'm like, one, it's like they feel like they're part of the equation, but also like they're learning what it's like to be in a position of power, right? Going mm -hmm. back to Stephanie's thing. So that it's like, this isn't new once they're in a role what, where mm -hmm. that requires that kind of thinking, right? So doing it early, allowing them to have a voice um, and also role modeling that, like letting them yeah. see you do that with the C-suite so that they know it's okay. And the other thing I would say is like, they're not going to get it right the first time. So I was like, be prepared to fail. Like, I don't want yeah. you to be like, hey, you're going to get this right the first time. Like, pivot and fail. Like, I'm all about that. And a lot of people are scared of that. But I think that's something we need to be endorsing more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You said something, Alex, that I really liked about teaching them what it's like to be in that decision making mm -hmm. seat. And like, empowerment isn't just saying, okay, you get to make the decision now. Good luck you have to be the safety net and the support and say like, I'm going to give you the space to make this decision. And I'm here for you as you figure it out. I know this is new for you. Um, and I want to make this, you know, this a safe journey for you. I think it's so important to provide that, that, I can say safe it's guard rails. It's guardrails, it's guardrails it's right? Guardrails. Yeah. yeah, it is guardrails. Yeah. Cause it can be scary the first time you're like, oh shit, this is my decision. Mm -hmm. Like, it's it can be really scary for people yeah. and they can't want get it. empowered without starting. yeah and you've got people on your team that say they want it but until they're right. in that position mm -hmm. they don't really know what comes totally. with that either mm -hmm. right yeah when i think about empowerment in the workplace i think a lot about the evolution of the workplace right and back in the day it was like come here do this assembly mm -hmm. line go home today our lives are so intertwined right we joked about kim having toy trains in the background y'all see my <laughs> crazy disaster of a background and this is only a very small snippet of my life but our lives today are so intertwined and the one thing i know to be true is that people want autonomy and they want agency mm -hmm. and because we've really had this merging of the worlds you know often I mean, myself, I don't know how many y'all are fully remote, but like those worlds are the same to me. So if I don't feel as if I have that agency and that autonomy, I don't feel empowered. And then I'm disengaged. And then I'm all those things that like, Kim, you are connecting back to the business purpose, right? And Rebecca, hard to find talent. All of that is so true. But when I think back before and it was so separate and you could come in, sure, I'll manufacture your car for you. Do, 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 out of there, right? Now it is so much more joined that empowerment is just absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I want to, amazing answers. And I want to dig in a little bit on what we said about guardrails around the safety net. I think this is really, really important when we think about a trauma-informed workplace. Because for some people, failure is not an option. They don't mm -hmm. feel safe failing because mm -hmm. of prior traumatic experiences. Mm -hmm. Those can be prior traumatic workplace experiences. It could be from childhood. It could be from a whole host of experiences. And creating safety and communicating it is so important when we give folks opportunity. And I think sometimes we forget about that as leaders. I know I've forgotten about it. You know, what supports does this person need so they can feel like they have a chance to try and maybe fail, maybe succeed, we'll see what happens, but try being the most important point. And I often say, you know, some people get frustrated, oh, this person doesn't have any grit or any resilience. And I'm like, well, you have to have the space to build that skill. Yeah. And so that is something that's so important. And I think probably something we need to have another panel on is talking about, you know, creating that space to build that resilience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, I didn't even bribe Alex. He teed up one of my next questions perfectly. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, micromanagement we know is the enemy of empowerment. Mm -hmm. And it is something so many managers struggle with, especially new managers. So if you could offer any advice to leaders looking to avoid micromanagement, what would it be? Oh, can I start? I am, I, yes, please. I care so much about this. So. Uh, learn from my failures. Um, I am so anti micromanagement that I built my career as a manager in like 
running away from micromanagement, not being sure what I was running towards, but just being like, I will never micromanage. Mm-hmm. I will not be that manager to like, I took it to the opposite end of the pendulum swing where I was not actively really managing. I was just like, here's your projects, go have fun. Yeah. And it wasn't until I got really good feedback from one of my direct reports who had had built empowerment in within herself from other jobs that, that she was able to stand up to me and say, hey, I need more guidance. I need more support on this. Like, I know you don't want to micromanage, but like, you're not managing me. And I was like, oh, fuck. (laughs) Like, my own trauma in being micromanaged meant that I like was not showing up for you in the way that you needed me to. Mm -hmm. And so now anytime I have a new direct report or I'm working with somebody on a project, I take a minute at the beginning to talk about work style and working relationship. Mm -hmm. And how do you like to work? How do you like to get feedback? How involved do you want me to be? And I always start with a caveat that like my default state is get aligned, leave each other alone, come back to connect when, you know, when we have something to connect on. And like, I'm trusting that if you don't say anything, everything's great. Um, But if that doesn't work for you, or if you need other something else, like I want to hear what your default state is. How Mm -hmm. often do you like to check in? What are you looking for in those check-ins? What do you not want? What freaks you out? What, like, I'll tell you what makes me scared. What makes me scared is if I'm trusting you that you're working all this time and then we come back to check in and you haven't done anything because you were waiting for me to check in on you, that I'm a, that's what I'm afraid of. So what are you afraid of? And just trying to have, even if it's like a 15 minute conversation before we start getting into any work, I do it with new hires like in their first week, like here's how I manage, how do you like to be managed? I mean, should I even talk about it in the interview process because I don't wanna hire someone who needs a totally different style of management than I can provide. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think it's not just about avoiding micromanagement. It's about tailoring, tailoring your leadership experience to the people that you're working with. Mm -hmm. Which also works in the, in the executive suite when it's your Mm -hmm. peers, Mm -hmm. knowing what they need to get on board with what you're doing, especially if you're in the people field and you're like all alone in your touchy feely people world. And you're on an exec team of people who only want data and business results you need to learn to speak their language and they need to learn to speak yours. But if no one has that conversation, then no one trusts anyone and there's no enablement. No enablement, only So, Kim, I'm laughing because I literally had this conversation with a team member of mine today (laughs) about like, I know I am not good with like the follow-up. Like I'm that person that like, I wanna hand you something and like, Thank you. Bye. It's out of my mind. mind. Yeah. Yeah. And so it is so like, but I know that I'm not good at that. And so I'm very open with that about my team member. And this is like how I talk about micromanaging is that I want to have a team that I can trust and that I trust to follow through. But I also need to let you guys know that this is where I suck. This is where I'm really Mm. bad at it. And like, I have these safeguards built in over here, but I might forget them. So, and so they keep me accountable, right? And and they'll bring it back up if I haven't in a while, but it's because I'm very open with my own shortcomings on the follow through. And I think that's, that's probably because a lot of us are very much high performers that if someone gives us something, we do see it all the way through. We take it, we run with it. We expect everybody to be like that. (laughs) And not everybody is like that, right? Like we learn the hard way. And so I think that's a great I think that's a great way when you talk kind of about like strengths and how do you leverage your strengths versus Mm -hmm. somebody else's strengths, right? Like you're very open. This is not a strength of mine, but I can see this is probably a strength of yours. So I need your assistance to kind of help bolster Mm -hmm. me up. And that's a great way to empower. Um, And I I think sometimes also micromanagement comes from their own trauma. Like there's something else going on with somebody who struggles with micromanagement that they, they don't have trust. They're unable to trust. And so I think kind of getting to the root of, you know, what is, what is driving, Having this need to be so involved on a, a task level where you don't need to be uh, and trying to kind of work through that. So I'm going to yep. do a plus a million to everyone because <laughs> plus one didn't seem enough. But I also want to say for me, empowerment also is like the sister of taking initiative mm-hmm. and um, in its own right. And I start that from the interview process. And one of the things I always say as it relates to micromanagement is like, hey, like whenever they ask about my leadership style, I'm like, 
So there's so much to be done. If you expecting me to do the job that I hired you for, then it's time to like brush up your resume <laughs> because there's two. And I'm like, I'm that honest because I'm like, I want you to shine, but also I don't have the time to look and like, I'm here to coach you. I'm not here to do your job for you. And I think there is a, I think there's a confusion with that in the workplace sometimes that we are there to critique and 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 sort of handle that situation where our job is really to coach them to be like, hey, this worked really well. This could have worked better. Right. Um, and I think there's a distinction there. But I don't want to be in the game of like handling people. I want to be in the game of coaching them. And I think that's. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, we, we use micromanaging as a shorthand for like that boss who won't get out of your shit. Mm -hmm. But like, there's so much to that, right? And there are employees who really like and need and want what some people might describe as micromanaging. And there are some executives who micromanage, but they don't see it as micromanaging. They see it as getting the information they need to make decisions. And so like Rebecca was saying, like really getting to the root of the why whether you are the micromanager or the micromanagee, like what is the what is the information you need? What is the experience you need? And what are some ways that we can get there without one person having to sacrifice their entire work style? Mm -hmm. Like if you're a CEO and you like, when I just heard a, a heard tale recently of a CEO who's like personally monitoring badge swipes to see who's coming and going oh in the gosh. building. And it's like, that is not an appropriate use of the CEO's time. No. But what is he, he, they, it's a he. What is he trying to, <laughs> no, no woman is doing that. Um, they know that their he, time and their salary is too valuable. Right? To like, be what is he trying football. to get to? What is Can the problem I know another male CEO that's done that. Too? <laughs> I mean, is this oh, an gosh. ego thing? Is this a power thing? Is this a productivity thing? Is this a, like, I'm worried. Fear. That it's fear-based. Right. And so like, that's where you have to really get into it of like, why are you doing this? Yeah. What are you trying to solve? And that, can we solve it in a different way that is a better use of your time? Mm -hmm. Because it's not about the micromanaging. It's about the problem that they're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. And it's the same way with an employee who wants to be micromanaged when you don't want to micromanage them. It's like, well, what is what is it that you're worried about? What is it that you're afraid of that if I'm not paying attention to your every move, you're going to miss out on? And how can we satisfy that need in a different way? Because I sure as hell do not have the time to babysit every yeah. day of your work. And usually in my experience, because I had to live that experience, which God, I hate that you brought that up, but I'm glad Sorry. you it. No, it's like a it's like a win-lose situation. Um, is that like I had to say to that CEO, like, what are we to your point, what are we trying to get at? Like, mm -hmm. you know what the answer is here. You're just like grabbing at straws because you don't yeah. want to really look at the you don't want to look at what the situation really is because that means you then have to address it. So let's go. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like it you just, have to solve the problem if you. Oh my God! The you got to solve now. the problem. I know. So it feels easier to like attack more things without yeah. coming to a conclusion. You yeah. know. And I'd love to expand though on Kim what you were talking about earlier with the manager, you know, employee relationship and like understanding each other's strengths. I do that with my entire team because it's not just a one way street. And like I'm often yeah. putting them in these group projects where I want them to work together. And so we sit down and we did this big matrix where it was like, everybody, you write down what you think your greatest strength is. And then you write down where you got a gap, right? So <laughs> I, you throw me an Excel spreadsheet filled with details and I've glazed over, right? So like that is not for me, but I have someone on my team that is really great at that. So it, it makes handing out these assignments, people get to pick what they enjoy doing and what they're good at. And then we can say, okay, now we need more than one person who's really good at Excel. Mm -hmm. So guess what? Now we're going to start cross training or start learning. And while we may not love it, like I've gotten really good at VLOOKUPs. <laughs> so, you know, we try to break out and, and expand. But I mean, Alex, Kim, I before my time, I heard a story about doing badge swipes and man too. But I just could not get over that. Sorry, and bros. I, sorry, bros. <laughs> But I really think it comes down to in those positions of power who are looking for these little devil in the detail things, they're mm -hmm. looking for a different answer than what they know. Mm -hmm. to yeah, know. you're totally yeah. right, Erica. They and want to point to something else to say that is the problem. The problem. It's not 
right. this big right. thing over here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. And I already told him, sorry, getting personal. I already told that individual <laughs> what the answer was. And he's like, mm, you're not wrong. But you're let's not right. You're not right. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's do bad swipe. It's you Jane know? who left five minutes early to pick up right her kid. That's what right? Yeah. Like that's that's why things are failing. That's why we're not making money is because exactly. Of, right? Yeah. So like and it's because it's and like to Kim's point, because that's an easy solve, right? That's you right. Know, for yeah. them, that's an easy solve than really kind of digging in and trying to figure out what's the real problem. And then they have to fix it because hundred times, a hundred percent, it's the it's the CEO's leadership style that's causing the problem and they don't want to face it. Well, and I don't know about the rest of you, but in my last year in particular, I've been like, my new thing is like how the push and the pull, how far can really, how can CEOs really be pushed and pull? Mm -hmm. And it's not until you're in it with them that you really understand what that looks like. They make a claim in an interview but it's not until you're with them in the thick of it <laughs> that you're like, oh, this is what it really looks like. Mm -hmm. This is the yeah. real deal with them, you know? I mean, who among us does not have the trauma of a CEO who said they wanted a partner? Yeah. And then you get into the company and you're like, yeah. Can you still what? see me? <laughs> <laughs> It's a great talk track, right? It's a great Kim talk just track. called us all out. HR has a seat at the table. HR has yeah. a seat at the table. And you're like, it's just yeah, like under like the table. The corner. Yeah. It's in the yeah, I'm, at the, I'm at the end of the table. <laughs> I feel like this is a trauma podcast for <laughs> yeah, HR people to come down. But so we don't totally <laughs> derail Stephanie's show. I will say this. And what I have learned with my team in particular is to... I communicate the outcome. I tell them what I want to see. Mm -hmm. And if there are any nuances that I need to know or be aware of, and I lay that out there and I'm like, how you figure that out? Goodbye. Good luck. <laughs> you know? And I let them do it. But it's all about that communication piece. It's all about communicating what outcome you need, how they arrive there. That's their own roadmap. And they have I to know that, that they have those guardrails and that safety net to yeah. flag to you when they start yes. stuck. They Absolutely. Help. That it's and okay. That psychological safety piece is important. Yeah. And I think too, for those of us who are coaches, you know, that's, that's is a true leadership style that I think more leaders need to develop, right? Is like trying to get people to come up with their own answers instead of just telling them what we know is the right, right. thing to do, but right. trying to get them to come up with that. And that way they have more buy-in, they have more empowerment because they're like, Oh, wow. Yeah, this worked. This was my idea. And I came up with this and it worked. Yeah. It is about stretching them until they're a little bit uncomfortable, though. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Like if, if you're not a little bit uncomfortable at some point, you're not growing and you're mm -hmm. not, you know, expanding. And y'all, I had the best exercise. I made my team sweat bullets. It was so <laughs> fabulous. Like it was hysterical. We came all together for this workshop. And I said, I really want us to be communicating together. We've all got great areas. We've all got areas we can improve. So I want to go around the table. I want everyone to say one thing that like they really love about that person and what they've done really well this year. And then one thing that was game changer for them. Yeah. And I was like, whatever that is. And I was like, and y'all got to do it for me too. So when I tell you, I was like, I'm going to give you an hour to go think about it. Come back. We're going to do this. When I tell you the number of text messages that I got about like, are you sure this is a good idea? Like, should we really do this? Yeah. And I said, yeah. And when I tell you that almost instantly after that, we were working stronger as a team, it was instantaneous. And like, they could not even believe it. And to crack, to crack myself up is they were like, Erica, you do too many spreadsheets. Like you try to be organized, but you cannot. And then you create 10 spreadsheets about the same thing when we already have it. And I'm like, oh, I didn't oh, know Erica, that. You and are my soul sister. Sure enough, yeah, they're like, yeah. here's another spreadsheet, Erica's making. <laughs> and we joke about it now, but now we all know that Erica's terrible at that. She's going to create seven of them, you know? That is so, I love that. Yeah. That is such a fabulous exercise. It'll make them sweat though. It'll yeah. really make them sweat. You, you gotta, I, I love what you said though. It's about growth because yeah. it, when we talked about it at the beginning, if you're not making sure your team, everyone on your team, uh, regardless of, you know, whether they want to be promoted or not they have an opportunity to grow. And, and if you without that feedback, that, as yeah. an HR team, you cannot give and mm -hmm. receive feedback mm -hmm. in a constructive way. 
then like we got bigger problems. But, How are you teaching the rest of the company to do it? Right? Yeah. And Erica Amazing. brings up a great point in that I'm sure we've all dealt with. It's like, why can we do this, but not that? And I'm like, oh my God, this again. <laughs> it's like, because the leadership team isn't comfortable with everything, right? It's, a, <laughs> you know, like you've got to, it's like life. You've got to pick and choose. There's going to be things that you're going to have to What's the word I'm looking for? It's too late in London. How about um, dance around? You got to yeah, dance, no, around. dance around. Yeah, yeah. you've got to you've got you've to gotta pick and choose what you can get because you're not going to get everything. And mm -hmm. but when you've got a team that doesn't know that, they just think like if it's good for the employees, it's good for the company. And you're like, I wish it was as simplistic as that. But there's other things that like build into that situation as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Amazing. Well, I mean, we could talk probably for another two hours on empowerment. <laughs> and then I think maybe three or four hours um, on an HR trauma dump. Maybe we'll, <laughs> maybe we'll do a special episode on that one. We're going to crew back together. We'll make a series. I yeah, love it. Absolutely. We'll create our own podcast. <laughs> Um, so before, you know, we let everyone go, I always love to hear from each of you, you know, if someone listening in wanted to learn more about empowerment, what would you recommend to them? You know, whether it's a book, podcast, training, whatever, you know, what's on your list to recommend to our listeners? Well, I pulled my favorite book out recently right here. So I'll just whip it right out. This is <laughs> called amazing. The Power Code. Okay. It's a new release. It's by Katie Kay and Claire Shipman. And it's all about how women see power in the workplace versus men mm. and how we can use power to help change the world, essentially. And it's a fabulous read. It will really empower you to step into your own power. So. Mm -hmm. There you go. That's good. That's good. I've got, you know, I've got two books that I think are are, are really great. One is kind of an, uh, a standout is um, Leaders Eat Last by Simon Sinek, which is fantastic on, on leadership and empowering teams and, and servant leadership. Um, but the other one, and it's, gosh, and I'm thinking about it right on the tip of my tongue. Well, I can't remember the author, but it's called um, The Intersection of Should and Must. And it's really about, and it's it's a short book. It has got beautiful graphics. It's not necessarily a leadership book, but it's about, you know, what are the shoulds and what are my musts and which which way do I, I follow and how can I empower myself to make that kind of decision? And it's just, it's a, it's a beautiful book, like literally to look at, but it also just has like some really thought provoking um, comments on how we make choices that are good for us um, and how we kind of decide what's, what are the things that I have to do and what are the things that I should do and how do I tell the difference? I'm going to go very non-traditional and say, take an improv class, uh, like especially that. if you live in a city that has comedy sports, mm -hmm. their particular brand of improv training um, was what I consider to be one of the most influential parts of my leadership development. I started working with them when I was in high school. Um, I've gone back to them over the years. I've had them lead corporate trainings. Um, they are so fucking good. But the, the thing that it teaches you is to make bold choices to make bold decisions and not be afraid of failure. Uh, in addition to many other lessons around supporting your teammates and trying to make each other look good. Yes. Anding everything. It's just, a, it's a great way to, to gain confidence and become comfortable with your body and your choices and the way your brain works and cannot recommend it enough. Amazing. I love that. Alex, I, wrap I us was... up say god it's so stressful because you all did so great well there's just so many great resources out there too it's like oh yeah i know that one too that one's a good one. <laughs> I know. so there's a podcast that i like called put yourself first and um it's a woman that talks about um inspiring conversations with other badass women so she'll empower you to make time for your personal goals and put yourself first so i am mm -hmm. um, a fan of it mainly because the people that have really grown and stretched me in my life are badass women. So Amen. sorry, men. Of course. sorry, men, of you course. didn't do it for me. You're too busy, <laughs> bad swimming. Women did it for me, including my mother. <laughs> um, so I would say check that out. <laughs> my view. I like it. 
<laughs> amazing, amazing. Thank you all so much. This was such a fun conversation and so informative. Um, I'm sure I will try and rope each of you into another panel sometime and maybe we will have to start our HR Trauma Dump podcast. Who knows? Um, but until next time, um, loved having everyone join us and our next panel will be on humility and responsiveness. So make sure and tune in. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone.